In the north of Europe, winters are hard. But the misery of some secures the survival of others. In Scandinavia, golden eagles live in the mountains and the lowlands. They are capable hunters, but still they can't survive without the victims which cold and snow claim every winter. Golden eagles are unsocial. They don't tolerate other eagles near their loot. One of them is driven away in the end, even though there is enough for both of them. Who would think of love in such harsh conditions? It remains to be seen if it is love, but golden eagle they mate up to 30 times before the female lays her eggs in early April. But we'll come back to that. Survival is paramount. An elk cow has fallen victim to the Scandinavian winter and is lying on the edge of a fjord, well preserved thanks to the icy cold. Eagle eyes have quickly discovered the huge food reserve. Now they're racing to get the first and biggest chunks. The fully grown golden eagle gets to the cadaver first and starts to feed on it. But before he gets to the coveted meat of the mammal, he has to work through the elk's dense winter coat. A sea eagle is keeping an attentive eye on the scene. He would love to fight the golden eagle for the prey. It seems to be worth a try. But then it appears that the sea eagle is losing heart. One plucky flap of the golden eagle's wings, and the sea eagle takes off. A second sea eagle swoops down from the perpetual dark grey Nordic winter sky. This one is making more of an impression on the golden eagle, but he's full anyway, and leaves the field to his cousin with a large yellow beak. In Nordic mythology, Reisvelgir is a giant in the shape of an eagle who brings wind over the land. Golden eagles need vast, untouched landscapes where nature is still relatively intact. Today, golden eagles mainly live in the mountainous regions of the Alps and the Carpathians. There are many different prey animals for the golden eagle between forest and mountain meadows. Although there are fresh twigs in the eyrie, the nest is not yet in use. A caper cayley also makes an attractive prey for the eagle. While the smaller female is well camouflaged and rarely leaves the protection of the forest, the conspicuous male capercaillie makes for easy prey, at least during the mating season. The hen rarely shows herself openly on the mountain meadow, and the male capercaillie would also bear to retreat back into the protection of the mountain forest.
A warm wind is blowing through the forest. Nature is waking from hibernation. It's thawing. There are more and more mountain forests where you can find large feathers of this size, eagle feathers once again. Breeding golden eagle couples are back in the heart of Europe. The eagle population also depends on the prevalence of their preferred animals of prey. Loose feathers are drifting across the ground. Caper Kale has become the victim of his testosterone levels. During the mating season, large amounts of testosterone flow through a Caper Kale's body and makes it careless. Golden eagles keep returning to their kill and feed on it until nothing is left. This way, every last bit of the prey is used. Eagles hardly make a dent in the Caper Kale population. Wherever its habitat is intact, the caper kale produces enough offspring to make up for these losses. Once a species of prey becomes rare, the predators will change over to other, more common species. It's a clever, and highly functional policy of nature. The eagle cruises above his territory, but this time he is not on the lookout for prey. The breeding season is upon them and the eagles need to prepare. They have been making regular courtship flights in their territory since the winter in order to strengthen their partnership. Free as a bird, the phrase has never seemed so apt. Somewhere on a scraggy tree, the two golden eagles finally land. And they mate yet again. Nothing stands in the way of a new generation of eagles, or so it seems. This is the ideal habitat for a golden eagle, a varied hunting ground and old mixed woodlands for breeding. Here is where the story of our eagle chicks begins. The male golden eagle has been incubating the egg for a few hours now. It's the only egg the female laid a few days earlier. It's the end of April, and all over the forests, birds have been looking for hiding places for their nests. In the neighboring valley to the golden eagles, at a safe distance, the black stork is floating back to its nest.
Now that spring has sprung, the eggs need to be kept warm at all times, on both sides. Both eagle parents will keep their precious egg warm day and night for some 45 days. For the black stalks, it takes five weeks until the chicks hatch. Body heat is the most important factor, but without sufficient padding and insulation, the egg can't develop. The male golden eagle has a ring. While it was assumed that it's the task of the mother bird to incubate the eggs, our eagle couple take regular turns. The eagle egg was only exposed to the cold of the April day for a few minutes. Now the female is flying towards the eyrie. Carefully, the ringless mother eagle settles on her egg. The eagles are nearly motionless when they incubate the eggs, and their neighbours, the black storks, are no different. A bit further down, Eurasian pygmy owls are one step behind. They still haven't laid any eggs. Not all golden eagles make their eyrie in old trees. Rock islands in an ocean of trees and shrubs. The main thing is that the breeding place is not easily accessible to predators. Up in the rock eyrie, the eggshell has already been broken. Here, two eggs were laid, from which two golden eagle chicks have already hatched. It's mainly the mother who keeps returning to the eyrie with green twigs of coniferous and deciduous trees. This way the nest keeps growing during the two and a half months of raising the chicks. The father's task is to provide food. He regularly supplies the eyrie with prey animals, which the female divides up and feeds to their offspring. This time, it's a mouse, which is torn into even smaller morsels and shared out by the mother. Ninety-five percent of all golden eagles hatch in a rock eyrie. The rest of them see the light of day in an eyrie on a tree, like our eagle couple, with their eyrie in an old fir tree who only have one chick to look after. The adult birds take turns in hunting for prey. Whenever wild prey animals become scarce, the fowl kept by humans suddenly become very obvious to the golden eagles. It's the perfect sitting game with a view of the pigeon loft. It's a warm day at the end of April. The eagle chick is plagued by annoying flies, just like the Eurasian pygmy owl a bit lower down. The largest and the smallest predatory birds of the mountain forests are tormented by the same pest. The female golden eagle is still sitting high above the pigeon lofts, waiting patiently for an opportune moment.
meantime, the male has been successful, returning to the Eyrie with what's left of a slain pigeon. Then he flies off again, leaving the rest of the work to the female. It's always she who tears up the prey and feeds it to the chick. Although individual eagles may prefer certain animals of prey, pigeons are not a golden eagle's regular target. They're usually too quick. It's the young, inexperienced pigeons which tend to become the victim of the Riesvelgier bird. It's a kind of natural selection. The eyrie of the golden eagle is slightly smaller than that of a sea eagle. It's 1.5 metres in diameter and roughly one metre in height, similar to that of the black storks in the neighbouring valley. Here, three insatiable young birds are waiting for their meal. In the eagle eyrie, the mother has to present tiny morsels of prey to her little one. At the black stork families, whole fish is again on the menu. In total, the eagle mother will feed some 40 kilograms of prey to her offspring over time. After feeding, the little snowy white black storks can play with each other while the eagle chick has to make do with his mother. When it gets cooler, the female offers warmth and comfort. There's another breeding bird in the eagle's territory, a common tree creeper. Even if the Eurasian pygmy owl is tiny, it is a highly specialized and dangerous bird hunter. A Eurasian pygmy owl will kill over 200 songbirds and small mammals to raise the offspring of one hatch. The tiny owl has seven chicks to look after. All the waste from the nursery is just thrown out of the door. The eagle mother keeps taking green twigs of coniferous and deciduous trees to the eyrie. We don't know why she does that. Maybe fresh twigs are a better building material than dry branches. She's always keen to keep her eyrie spick and span. Some biologists suspect that the green twigs and leaves have an antiseptic effect, but there is no proof for this theory as yet. The struggle to feed their offspring and to maintain the nest's furnishings completely fills the eagle's day. The eagle couple will use this eyrie for many years, 
They will keep repairing and expanding it, just like the black storks do. The eagle mother is leaving the eyrie to go hunting. It's early May and warm, and the chick doesn't need to be constantly kept under her wings anymore. In Europe's mountainous forests, it's not only the eagles and storks who breed now. The plant kingdom is also all about passing on its genes. Old Lacuno's mixed beech forests are also the home of Europe's most magnificent orchid, the lady's slipper orchid. Wherever lady slipper orchids blossom and golden eagles have their eyries, nature is at least to some degree still intact. The male golden eagle is bringing another rodent to the eyrie. This time it's a huge water vole. And the female is bringing another twig, but she immediately takes over control of the nest. Black storks have little to fear from golden eagles. They are able to defend themselves and never let the chicks in their eyrie out of their sight. Here, both adult birds are responsible for feeding the young chicks. The eagle chick, on the other hand, is only ever fed by the female. The prey, rich in protein and energy, which is brought to the nest for weeks on end and is then digested here and there, means the concentration of nutrients is enormously high. Leftover food and manure fertilise the surrounding forest ground.